Reorganizing the land and the ways its spaces can be put to new uses will mean change for those who live there. Different rules and a change in their daily habits. In Mozambique, the French development agency, the AFD, provided 11 million euros of financial aid between 2007 and 2015 to help create the Limpopo National Park. On completion, the AFD requested an evaluation, both audiovisual and in writing, of the impact of its project. Both the visual and written reports were produced in a simultaneous and coordinated manner. Until 2001, this area of almost 10,000 square kilometers was an old hunting reserve and was already a protected area. Since the end of the Mozambican Civil War, 26,000 people have lived off its natural resources. In 2002, it was declared a national park. After the many years of civil war, unrest and fighting, involving three countries. The establishment of the park, once a battlefield until 1992, marked renewed and more peaceful relations between the three nations. There were originally two national parks, the Kruger in South Africa and the Gonarezu in Zimbabwe. With the Limpopo National Park close to both these countries, the idea was to create a conservation area that transcended borders. I think in this case, I uh, was looking at the government in you know, all objectives. One is that uh, we need to be part of the global effort in terms of conservation of nature. And Mozambique has selected in you know, order to do it through a creation of national park. And Limpopo National Park is one park that was created after the independence of Mozambique, while other parks which were already in place, they were created by the Portuguese government at the time. The decision to establish a park was taken at a very senior state level and had the support of the SADC regional organization. The aim was peace and reconciliation. The initiative was also supported by the Peace Parks Foundation, a South African NGO. And this idea of transfrontier conservation is a very practical change that you can effect on the ground. It's not only political, it's not only theoretical, it actually changes. You, you can see animals move between the boundaries, you can see tourists move between the countries. You can see the cultures which were divided, the Shangan people, are reunited. The size of the challenge is enormous. The almost 10,000 square kilometers of the park is as large as Jamaica. Usable roads are few. There was no tourist infrastructure. And the wild animals had fled the region during the Civil War. The 26,000 inhabitants were scattered among 58 villages, mostly close to sources of water. So how has this immense area been reorganized? Has a new balance been established and will it last? The project has two main objectives. Firstly, to reintroduce wildlife and secondly, to generate revenue by developing tourism. avec le, la conviction, le pari en fait, que en, en conservant et en exploitant de façon durable la ressource naturelle, 
ont créé du développement et qu'il y avait dans certains coins d'Afrique, et notamment au Mozambique, un enjeu fort à créer du développement à partir de la conservation. To achieve this, the project set to work on several fronts. The reintroduction of wild animals, social and economic assistance for the local population, and the creation of new infrastructure. All three components are interdependent and form a type of virtuous circle. Ideally, the project's management team would have adequate human and financial support. Wildlife is reintroduced and well protected. And thanks to their social and economic development, the local inhabitants are engaged and on board. New infrastructure is built for visitors and tourism develops, generating income for the park's management, the local population and the protection of wildlife. And the virtuous circle is completed. The project began in 2001 under the auspices of the Ministry of Tourism. The German KFW Development Bank is the main founder, providing 6.1 million euros of financing. The AFD joins the project in 2007, bringing in 11 million euros. Is the National Park project relevant for all those involved? Does it serve everyone's interests? The future Limpopo Park will border one of the world's great national parks, the Kruger. Approximately one and a half times larger than the Limpopo, the Kruger was established over 100 years ago and gets some 1.5 million visitors every year. Why should the Kruger care about the Limpopo? Kruger Park. Uh, many people argue that they already have too many elephants. So where does, does this excess elephants go to? So Kruger was looking, you know, they was looking at Mozambique as a place to allow elephants to move into a bigger area because, you know, the elephant population was getting too big in, in, in South Africa. To the government of Mozambique, the incentives include the development of tourism, providing a boon for the local economy, which largely depends on agriculture, that employs nearly 70% of the workforce. Progress in other sectors, in particular tourism, through the national parks, would lessen the reliance on agriculture. That park was created, but we did not have funding to run it. So we had, our expectation was that we'll get um, funding from AFD and that will help us to establish the park and uh, in, uh, initiate to develop it. KFW, the German investor, got the project underway by providing the funds to set up the management team and construct some of the infrastructure. The project manager is the Peace Parks Foundation, a South African NGO which had the original idea for the Limpopo. The AFD joins in 2007 with the aim of complementing the German financier. On voulait dans ce partenariat qui se mettait en place échanger nos deux légitimités l'AFD étant beaucoup plus légitime et de, depuis longtemps en Afrique sur tout ce qui est développement agricole, développement rural, euh, accès aux fonciers, travail avec la petite paysannerie. En revanche, sur euh, le savoir-faire pour appuyer euh, la conservation, les parcs, le côté biodiversité, la KF euh, était bien plus avancée que nous là-dessus. Donc euh, l'idée, c'était d'échanger. Together, the two main funders, AFD and KFW, finance most of the project's components. The two exceptions were that KFW entirely financed population resettlement and the AFD backed zone support, the social and economic development component. Cool. 
An independent written and audiovisual assessment of AFD participation began in the autumn of 2015. How successful have the principal players been in transforming the region? What are the visible results in the 13 years since the park was established and the eight years since the AFD became involved? The presence of animals in the park is the principal measure of the project's success. Has the park been able to reintroduce and then protect the wildlife? A gradual restocking of game has taken place since 2003. When we started there, there was a program of, of wildlife relocation, translocation. So we, we built a sanctuary um, in the one corner of the park. We fenced sort of a portion of Kruger and the, and the, and the dam. We built a fence there and start stocking it with, with wildlife and also with elephant because they tried to bring in elephants in the beginning and they, they all moved back. You know? And then we put an electric fence uh, in the sanctuary and we relocated about 100 elephants in there. And we kept them there for about three years and then we opened them up, and they stayed in the park. Soon afterwards, the fences that separated the Kruger and Limpopo parks were removed along a 30-kilometer stretch. Now animal migration can take place freely, and wildlife is steadily reappearing in the Limpopo. Elephant and, and buffalo are over a thousand animals, so between a thousand and a thousand four hundred animals, both both species, and both have obviously showed a big increase since the initiation of the park, um, where elephant were only about forty animals estimated in the in the area, a small herd. The park's long-term prospects and the development of tourism largely depend on the good health and sufficient numbers of wild animals. The team must constantly monitor, record any notable development, and if necessary, intervene. A census of all the animals takes place every two years, partly conducted from the air. You're flying transects, which means straight lines, okay. and every third transect. So you fly one transect, leave two. Fly one, leave two. And, and then every single animal that you see on that transect is recorded the number, the species, and then it gets a GPS point. Flyovers give a good picture of how the larger animals are doing, but are not able to provide an accurate count or allow close supervision of individual animals or of herds. But in recent years, the park has had to face one of its greatest threats, Poaching. Rhinos and elephants are particularly vulnerable. The whole of Africa is facing an unprecedented outbreak of poaching. In 2007, 13 rhinos were killed in South Africa, but by 2014 that number had risen to more than 1,200. Continent-wide, the poaching of elephants for their ivory reached a critical point in 2010, when the very future of the species was threatened. Elephant poaching problem in the entire Africa, we know that. There's an epidemic of elephant poaching, and it has slowly been coming south and slowly been coming south, and it would always reach us prior to reaching the Kruger National Park. It has now reached the Kruger National Park. They've lost some animals. So the elephant poaching is now with us. Every wildlife park in Africa, including the Kruger and the Limpopo, is facing increasingly well-organized international criminal gangs. And as elsewhere, the Limpopo is witnessing a violent battle. One ranger and four poachers have been killed between 2011 and 2015. 
Even some of the rangers have been corrupted. The majority come from villages inside or near the park and are particularly vulnerable to being pressured by the criminals who control poaching. I think we have a fair amount of corruption in our, our range of force. We know, we know more or less who those people are. But there are a, a large amount of dedicated people in this organization here. There are some others that I would not go into the field with, quite frankly. I would, uh, it's very easy to, to kill somebody by accident, say, oh, I shot the person, my rifle went off, you know. On a doté des moyens supplémentaires, notamment pour la création d'une brigade d'unité spéciale qui travaille donc étroitement avec les rangers en Afrique du Sud, donc à la fois sur, sur le, la, la frontière entre le Limpopo et, et le Kruger, mais aussi dans le cœur de la, de la, du Limpopo, c'est-à-dire la, la rivière Shinguezi, qui, qui est de par le réseau hydrographique, attire évidemment des populations importantes de, de faune sauvage. The intensive protection zone unit is mainly financed by the AFD and is composed of about 30 rangers recruited in 2012 and 2013. It's received specific training and weapons that the other rangers have not. And its flexible organization has proved helpful and made it more mobile. Since the unit's deployment, the numbers of poachers arrested and charged, as well as weapons seized, have increased significantly. However, most poachers are released after a short period. In my opinion, the judicial system is fairly corrupted in Mozambique, and especially here. So uh, many of the people that were going to court to testify against poachers very often end up almost being accused of something that they didn't do, um, beating up the person or, or, or taking money from them. And then they end up almost being the, the accused in the court case rather than the people that are, that are giving evidence against the criminal who's standing in the dock. Unfortunately, corruption is rife. Despite the problem being recognized and openly discussed, bribery continues to undermine some institutions and administrations. La lutte contre le braconnage, c'est un problème global et donc il faut pouvoir s'y attaquer sous toutes ses formes. Donc il y a besoin pour ça évidemment d'une volonté réelle, d'une volonté forte du politique. Conservation and biodiversity is the principal objective in the Limpopo. Despite the plague of poaching across the continent, wildlife has increased noticeably in the Limpopo since the park's foundation. But the threat continues and the fight will need to be intensified with the help and support the AFD and others are providing. Support for the local inhabitants is a fundamental issue. Cohabiting with wild animals can often lead to conflict and serious damage to both humans and the animals. About 26,000 people live in the park. 20,000 of them live on its fringes. And it has been agreed that they should stay there in a specific region. A support zone with its own special regulations. Then, in the park itself, approximately 6,000 residents are scattered amongst several villages. They are thought to be potentially at risk or to present one to the wildlife. A decision was taken to move them either to the support zone or to the areas outside of the park. The AFD does not provide the finance for this move. Our aim, therefore, is not to evaluate this component, but to deal with its main points, as it does nevertheless impact the project as a whole. The Mozambican government is strongly opposed to any forced relocation and prefers using incentives and persuasion. We've, we've tried to move away from the term resettlement and, and more towards the term of development through resettlement. We're developing the communities, moving them from the past to the future. 
um, roads, health, water, etc. According to the World Bank, 70% of all Mozambicans live below the poverty line. Inside the park, the villagers survive through agriculture and livestock. But have no infrastructure. There are few roads, no school buildings, no health center, and no power. Resettlement would be a first step to a better life. You'll have a house, you'll have water systems within your village, you'll have school, you'll have education, um, you'll have part of an irrigation scheme uh, as part of income generation and, and, and more sustainable food sources. This village was displaced some 30 kilometers from its original location. The park and the government financed new infrastructure for 53 families. They've been here for about three years. The promised houses and the school were built. But other promises are taking longer to fulfill. And yet others have not been kept at all. Yeah, I the villagers say there are other problems that affect their daily lives. There's still no health center and access to water is sporadic. There are other problems in this sensitive situation. Not just housing and the availability of new land, but also the terms and conditions of moving the local inhabitants. Moreover, the public institutions are being slow to get involved in the process, for which they are, in fact, legally responsible. When we decided about it, we underestimated our readiness to do the resettlement. In terms of finance, in terms of institutional capacity from our side to do it. There was, you know, a big pot, you know, of complaints in there. That was a conflict between the park and the government, between the park and the communities, between the communities and the government and in the park. Negotiations with local communities are interminable. Here in Bingo, one of the villages in line for resettlement, talks began 12 years ago. The villagers signed an agreement to move, but the government no longer has the means to build new infrastructures for them. The delays do little to build up confidence in the authorities. <laughs> Basically what the plan is now, we, we have five villages uh, which are going to be uh, resettled under the uh, current system and we hope that we can conclude the remaining houses uh, until let's say 2017-2018. Let's hope. The AFD provides funding for another essential component dedicated to the local people, those 20,000 or so scattered across some 50 villages on the inner fringes of the park. Their lands fall within the remit of the support zone, a sort of halfway zone between the heart of the conservation area 
and the rest of the territory. Wild animals have access to this zone and the use of its natural resources by its human inhabitants is governed by specific regulations. Hunting, fishing and the production of charcoal, for example, can be banned or limited to protect the biodiversity. It means a loss of income for the locals who survive on these natural resources. The law is clear. The utilization of the natural resources, maybe uh, communities have access to those, they've got the right to those natural resources, but the, the park is responsible for governing the utilization in a sustainable way. So they can chop down trees, they can hunt, they can do things, but they have to do it in a way that is not detrimental to the environment. Has the economic and social development outlined in the plan compensated for this loss of income? Has it made the local inhabitants feel a part of the park project? As the project unfolded, time was spent in raising awareness amongst the residents in the support zone about the wildlife, the main economic opportunities, crop protection and the exploitation of natural resources something that would have an immediate effect on their income. In fact, most of the inhabitants that were interviewed mainly spoke of what they're not allowed to do anymore. However, Mozambican law and the park project does allow for a certain amount of flexibility. The locals can, for example, cut wood or fish under certain circumstances. However, the principle of dialogue and negotiation was never effectively followed through. It's just that um, people are always people. Change people's minds is not easy, including their, we, we somehow interfere in their life if they have to change some of the activities like uh, hunting and so on. I, I couldn't advise to do that, to start negotiating that kind of, of relation here. Yeah. That in the future can be, can be done, but now it's, it's a bit complicated. In the long term, it is hard to maintain a position of obligation without negotiation. During the dry season, resorting to fishing and hunting of smaller animals is a necessity. As compensation for loss of revenue, the project has set up new economic activities that revolve around automated irrigation systems. An automated irrigation system is a real boost. At this time of year, the plants in the same area won't grow unless there's water.
Here, the Chimbotani Association can get two harvests a year. They grow beans and corn. Today, a group that once had trouble finding just 40 members is now turning many more away. Eighteen of the 50 villages in the support zone have benefited from this irrigation system. While the results appear to be positive, they are hard to measure with any great precision, as reliable data on the amount of revenue that is generated is unavailable. Failures are frequent, and by the autumn of 2015, one-third of the irrigation systems had broken down. Usually it's the pump, which appears to be of poor quality, with spare parts unobtainable. There is another means of compensation. Under Mozambican law, on top of the state tax, the national parks have to hand over a further 20% of their revenue. The idea is that the money should be equally distributed between the villages as a means to finance community projects. In fact, the redistribution, which has to pass through three different committee phases, is not something most locals are aware of. They play little part in choosing the projects, even though the AFD had stipulated the local communities were to be consulted and trained. Talk about capacity uh, within the communities. These communities have been organized in committees, associations, and so on. And um, we still, uh, there's some challenges there within these uh, committees um, where uh, the capacities are not quite enough to respond to the needs for them to continue. Most of the 20% levy is used for livestock schemes, but it depends on the park's revenue, which for now is fairly low, as tourism has yet to develop. On the other hand, the process of consultation and support for the population has only been partially achieved and doesn't really let the local inhabitants become closely involved in the project. Despite its problems, the redistribution circuit exists and works. Park officials noted the increasing number of animals caused tensions to rise with the human population. These often ended not just in fields being destroyed, but in the death of a human or an animal. A large number of these conflicts occur around sources of water, areas used for agriculture, but also where animals come to drink. When the park project was conceived, there were no plans to stop animals from entering the support zone. Il y avait cette 
parce qu'on n'était pas l'Afrique du Sud, on ne mettait pas des parcs en barrière, euh, on était un pays où on allait prouver qu'on pouvait faire ensemble de la conservation et du développement. Les conflits hommes faune sauvage se sont multipliés et il y a eu une revendication extrêmement forte des populations pour faire en sorte euh, qu'on euh, qu limite ces conflits et donc euh, demande à l'AFD euh, de, de financer euh, une clôture euh, dans la partie sud du parc hein, puisqu'on n'a pas clôturé euh, l'intégralité du parc mais simplement 56 km euh, pour limiter dans cette partie où il y a la plus grosse concentration humaine euh, les conflits avec euh, la faune sauvage et en particulier avec les éléphants. About 60% of the population in the support zone live in the southeastern quarter of the park and this is the area the fence mainly protects. It stretches from the entrance of the park northwards for 56 kilometers. However, the procurement and construction phases of the fence encountered a number of difficulties. The first one, we were not clear about what type of fence we wanted. Some people, some were, def the, the defining about, uh, were defending a fence uh, electric fence, another people, another group of people were defending a very strong fence but without any electricity that can, could hold the elephants. And when we described the type of fence we want, I think we did not describe well, we tried to describe both, so we're confusing the bidders. These problems not only delayed construction but also increased the cost. The AFD had to adjust its budget, but at a cost to the social and economic program within the support zone. We thought that we are killing most of the bad things that they were affecting, you know, on a negative way, the communities outside. So to me, the decision of shifting, you know, that money for something which is more for a long term, but also which could be sustainable, because it will last, you know, for longer, uh, was the best decision, you know, that was made. The fence did stop the larger animals, notably the elephants, from passing through. It also reduced the number of flashpoints between animals and humans. There was better protection for agriculture, and the fence meant the area of support could be extended. In the end, the objectives for the support zone have been only partly met. In terms of awareness, the people have understood the new regulations, even if they don't necessarily abide by them. And so too with economic development, which has been less than hoped for. But one of the most remarkable aspects of the reorganization of the territory has been the lack of participation of the local authorities. Despite being asked by the park, they have been very slow to get involved. Has new infrastructure been enough to satisfy the needs of tourism and therefore create a revenue stream? Has it also reached the stated aim of economic development for the benefit of the local population? The AFD provided financial support for several types of infrastructure, including the entrance to the park, the various camping sites, and five wooden chalets in the most visited camp close to the entrance. The construction went ahead smoothly, and they are now open for business. The AFD also met the costs of repairing or building roads, in broad terms, these were in two main areas. The first is in the interior of the park to allow tourists to circulate. We maintain the road between Giriondo and, and Massingier. Also maintenance of some of the tourism roads such as the road to Ekepeskera camp and, and the road up to Madonzi. We also constructed a new bridge over the Madonzi river. What was planned but not implemented was the bridge over the Shingwezi river. Um, which we'll have to implement in the future because that gives access to the north of the park during the wet season. The other section of roads financed by the AFD were on the park's borders. 
Running along the edges of the support zone, it aims to connect the communities within the zone to local markets. But construction of these roads is falling far behind schedule. From the launching of a tender to the implementation, you, we experiment problems. And it's our first time doing roads in parks. You know, the procurement is more complex, but it has to be, because you have to be detailed on what you analyze and so on. And that there was a problem of implementation. The company didn't have capacity to implement. We also got in conflicts with them, uh, which were, were not completely resolved. We did not pay them because they were not delivering enough. Et donc aujourd'hui, si on peut être assez satisfait des pistes qui ont été réhabilitées ou construites à l'intérieur du parc, en périphérie du parc, tout n'a pas été fait de façon à relier l'intégralité, je dirais, de la partie de la partie est du parc, donc entre Pafouri et, et Massinger. At this point, the park is more or less cut in two. In the south, there are chalets, campsites, and roads the infrastructure to welcome tourists in a comfortable manner. But getting around in the northern half of the park remains more challenging. With the road along the border still not providing the inhabitants access to local markets. Tourism is vital to the park's economic growth and therefore its sustainability. Has its development led to some economic stability? From the very start of the project, there was a clear development plan, with a strategy, objectives and a market position all carefully defined. The crucial question was how to coexist alongside the world-renowned Kruger Park. Kruger National Park uh, it's a hundred-year-old park, so it's got a very well-established infrastructure. It's got an incredibly expansive road network, and you've got tar roads, and you can visit the entire Kruger National Park by tar road. Very sophisticated, very well-developed. Limpopo National Park also offers certain ecological features, environmental features, natural features that Kruger doesn't have. It's more a experience, a wilderness experience. And there's a need for both products from the tourism side. At the heart of the development of tourism were the eight concessions given to private businesses. Their task was to improve tourist services and products in several locations and pour revenue back into the park. But both legal and financial complications are still preventing the installation of these concessions. While a solution is being found, only one private company has so far set up inside the park on a trial basis and in an area where there are many wild animals. The company markets especially in Holland, uh, Germany and France. And those travel agencies or tour operators send clients for us. So they'll send the package that people come from Joburg, um, they do they do my champagne, then they go to the coast, and then they go back to South Africa. The site can accommodate only eight people at a time. It's been here seven years, and for the first time is now starting to break even. But would the park also be able to pay for itself? In 2004, it had been predicted the park would make annual revenues of between 1 and 2 million euros within the 2010-2014 time frame thereby covering its entire running costs. But even though the Limpopo is one of the parks that generate the highest revenues on a national level, today's estimates are more measured. The results are bien en deçà de ce qui avait été prévu et évidemment c'est des répercussions majeures à la fois sur la capacité du parc à assurer son autonomie financière et puis aussi euh, pour les populations à avoir des recettes pour euh, ensuite euh, mener un certain nombre de projets de, de développement communautaire. L'expérience montre que c'est très très compliqué pour un parc en Afrique d'atteindre l'autonomie financière. D'autre part, euh, au Mozambique, la situation est compliquée par la concurrence présente dans les pays voisins. Donc là, on parle du, de l'Afrique du Sud, 
bon, le Kenya est un peu plus loin, mais il y a la Tanzanie, euh, la, la Namibie, le Botswana qui ont des parcs déjà bien établis et qui attirent déjà des touristes. Donc il y a une concurrence qui est, qui est pas loin, mais euh, je pense que c'est en étant réaliste, ils auront besoin d'un appui important euh, sur la durée. Whether the park balances the books or not, increasing its revenue is at present a crucial issue. Not just because financing from the AFD has ended, but also to improve the economic development of the local population within the support zone. At present, it's handicapped by a lack of visibility. Delays in resolving all the various problems, such as poaching or the resettlement process, have pushed back the implementation of a proper communication strategy. Nevertheless, the example of Machampani, the one private company that's set up in the park, is clear evidence that targeted advertising can help find both clients and a market. The team in charge of the project's management has a key role to play. They are the ones who shape the park's development strategy. So what was the role of the financial backers in supporting or guiding the team? Between 2009 and 2014, a large portion of the AFD's funding went towards staff salaries. Most employees were locally recruited, rangers, secretaries and some department heads. But over the years, there has been a significant staff turnover. <laughs> Most of the people that were employed, you know, for the activities that were implemented in the park, they were uh, uh, recruited, you know, through uh, the projects. So their salary was much higher than, the, you know, the people that they were paid, you know, from the government. And that created, you know, some kind of instability in terms of uh, retaining you know, the, the, the best people in the project. By and large, the park's development managers were either technical assistants from the Peace Park Foundation, who specialize in conservation, or Mozambique government representatives. The investors' methods of financing were to play an important role in balancing the power of the project's actors. On a pensé qu'il fallait anticiper notre départ du projet, enfin notre retrait du projet, en tout cas, qu'est-ce qui se passe quand le projet est fini et qu'il n'y a plus l'argent. Donc, de fait, c'est comme ça qu'on a construit le projet, en disant, il faut qu'on structure une cellule projet ou une cellule de suivi du projet, mais logée à l'intérieur de l'administration mozambicaine, et c'est les gens de l'administration en charge des parcs qui vont suivre ce projet, et non pas une ONG sud-africaine, comme c'était le cas avec KFW. The park or the government of Mozambique had more power to deal with the IFD uh, uh, project, while you know the KFW uh, uh, funding PPF was more strong on what should be done, you know, in the project. But this method of financing also had its disadvantages. There were considerable delays in purchasing for the roads, the fences, and for the support zone. In some cases, as long as two years. So the AFD approach, uh, using the existing procurement process of the Mozambican government, was much slower. It was less, less developed, less sophisticated for that type of investment to flow, for the money to flow. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, requirements for documented approval processes, each time going to Maputo, um, getting the, the decision makers to support and understand the decision to sign off and bringing back. So, so that was probably our biggest challenge, was just that the, the, the documented process of getting approvals. Mm -hmm. The funneling of financial aid through the Mozambican state led to a certain amount of administrative inertia. Yet the capacity building that accompanied it did result in the greater implication and accountability of the country's authorities. 
Il y a eu au, au fil du temps un renforcement des compétences de l'administration mozambicaine, que ce soit celle qui a une vocation à, à développer les stratégies et à les mettre en œuvre au niveau national, donc l'Agence nationale des, des aires de conservation, mais aussi et surtout, c'est ce qu'il y a de plus important au niveau local, donc dans les parcs euh, na, nationaux euh, mozambicains. As the project unfolded, the PPF also provided technical assistance to Mozambican authorities, which reinforced their skills, eventually leading to a better balance of powers. And in a fairly unusual step, the Mozambican government gradually took over paying the park's salaries, notably those of the rangers. But there remained a lack of balance, though, their skills on the project were largely those of the environmentalists. While most of the funding from KFW and AFD concentrated on economic and social human development. Creating a park means going far beyond just biodiversity. It's a political project with a vision of the territory and its future. Within this perspective, the AFD's particular contribution has proved positive on several fronts. It has led to a certain readjustment of control by strengthening the role of the Mozambican administration. It has also permitted the supervisory body, the ANAC, to achieve a degree of autonomy. And the park itself, it's on its way to greater management freedom. In the implementation phases, the AFD demonstrated a great deal of flexibility in an effort to face the numerous and unpredictable challenges. Not every desired change has been fully achieved. Occasionally, due to factors beyond the project's control, such as the vast increase in poaching. But sometimes also due to internal reasons. The social and economic growth of the local villagers has had mixed results, something partially explained by the lack of specialists in the management team. C'est vrai qu'on n'a pas, euh, on s'est pas doté euh, de l'accompagnement d'ONG spécialisées sur l'intensification euh, et euh, la possibilité d'étendre, je dirais, les, les nouvelles cultures euh, qu'on essaie de, 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 de promouvoir vis-à-vis euh, -vis des agriculteurs. Euh, C'est un point qu'on qu recherche maintenant dans tous nos projets de conservation. Despite this, the park has provided the impetus for a new dynamics and some profound changes such as the system now in place for the distribution of revenue to the local population, even if it's far from perfect yet. Wildlife is, by and large, surviving the outbreak of poaching. Regarding the communities living in the support zone, resettlement is the clearly recognized final objective, even if the process remains fragile. A marketing plan for tourism already exists, but now needs greater visibility. The initial objectives were certainly overly ambitious, given the projected period of financing. In 2015, the project still seemed a little unsteady. With the environmental approach, public institutions and the social policy each having a different influence on the conduct and the development strategy of the project. The future success of the park will eventually depend on this, the common action and commitment of all the partners to achieve the new social, institutional and physical nature of the territory. Mm -hmm.